really somber sight in Blunt County for all of East Tennessee for the fallen deputy. Deputy Greg McCowan is remembered as a father, a grandfather, and a devoted Blunt County Sheriff's deputy. Now, DeHart has not entered a plea on the charges he is currently facing. We're working to learn more as to what this we can expect in this court hearing. It is expected to get underway in just a few minutes now. Again, he is charged with first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, and being a felon in possession of a weapon charges. This court appearance will present the facts as to why he's facing those charges. Now, they did release the body camera footage from the traffic stop on February 8th on Friday. We shared that edited version for you inside the WVLT News app. That may be presented today in court as part of the evidence as to why he's facing the charges he is facing this morning. Now it is believed that several people assisted him while he was on the run for five days after this traffic stop in February 8th, leaving so many in East Tennessee on edge due to his being on the loose in this terrifying incident. And we do know, fortunately, that Deputy Shelby Eggers is on the mend. She was released from the hospital immediately after the shooting the next day. So she is doing okay. We're going to continue to follow her progress. But this morning, Kenneth DeHart faces first-degree murder and attempted first-degree murder charges, along with being a felon in possession of a weapon charges. Again, he is accused of killing. Deputy Greg McCowan and injuring Deputy Shelby Eggers after this traffic stop. We already saw him in court once. He was denied bond. He is staying in jail until we can figure out the timeline for a potential trial in this case. We are still waiting on court to begin. Now, this court session was scheduled to start at 9 o'clock. The judge has entered the courtroom. People are waiting for everything to resume. Once that gets going, we'll definitely listen in. Now, if you're just joining us, we're keeping a close eye on Blunt County Criminal Court, where Kenneth DeHart is facing several charges in a preliminary hearing. This is a photo of when he was finally captured after that terrifying five-day manhunt. Scary situation. It looks like he is now entering the courtroom. We want to listen in to what is happening during this preliminary hearing where they'll present facts as to why he's facing the charges he is facing. Please, Mr. DeHart was arrested on the 13th day of February this year. Uh, he was brought before your honor on the 15th last Thursday, at which time our office was appointed. Uh, at that time, we had not spoken to Mr. DeHart. Since then, he has more than once expressed a desire to hire counsel and has informed us that he is in the process of doing that. We are asking the court to continue this case for a week or two weeks so that he's able to employ counsel. Uh, he has a right to a counsel of his choice, just like any person would have the right to hire their own lawyer or their own doctor uh, if they needed medical treatment. The Constitution of the state of Tennessee, as well as that of the United States, affords uh, a defendant a right to the assistance of counsel and if he can afford it of counsel of his choice. Uh, we have spent several hours trying to prepare this preliminary hearing and as far as I can say uh, we believe that we will be able to do a competent job. We're not saying that we aren't prepared but we are saying that uh, Mr. DeHart has the right to counsel of his choice. As far as I know, this is a case of first impression because I have never in 50 years of practice had this come up to where uh, a person wasn't given, in this county at least, at least two weeks to hire a lawyer. 
uh, in the, every court I've ever been in front of, including Your Honor numerous times, uh, defendants are usually given a couple of three weeks to hire a lawyer. Uh, this case is as serious as any case can be. Uh, if he's able to hire a lawyer, I will not be surprised if it costs him in the neighborhood of $100,000. I don't know how many of us could come up with that kind of money at short notice uh, if we were required to do that. So we suggest it's not unreasonable. He is in custody. He doesn't have a bond. He's not going anywhere. Uh, on top of which, we want to make sure that is the public defender's office wants to make sure he gets a fair trial as possible. As Judge Delosier always said, quoting an authority that I've forgotten, justice not only must be done, it must also be seen to be done. We want to avoid any possibility of a, of a post-conviction relief if he should get convicted. We want to make sure that all the processes are properly complied with. He has said that he's able to he or his family, I'm not sure which, is able to employ a lawyer. He would like to do that, and he would like to have a reasonable time to be able to do that. So with all due deference, we're asking Your Honor to continue this case for a week or two so that he can obtain counsel. General. Your Honor, uh, respectfully to Mr. Garner's motion, the state would oppose. I certainly understand the motion. And where he's coming from, however, it has been 12 days uh, since the alleged conduct that has brought us in here to court today. Five of those days, the defendant was out of custody. The defendant and anyone on his behalf who might hire counsel was certainly fully aware during those five days out of custody that he was going to need an attorney. Um, he has now been in custody seven days. Uh, the court has given him adequate time to hire an attorney. In fact, attorneys have contacted my office and I believe the public defender's office about this case and they have either declined to represent the defendant or they have not been able to reach terms with the defendant uh, regarding uh, their representation. So respectfully, he has very adequate counsel, very competent counsel. There are no attorneys in Blount County uh, more experienced than Mr. Garner and Mr. Elrod. They have handled more cases like this than anyone. So respectfully, he has competent counsel. All parties are prepared to go forward. He has been given adequate time by this court, which is all the law requires, to obtain an attorney of his choice. He has failed to do so. He has competent counsel. The state would ask that we move forward at this time. Mr. Garner, anything else? No, Your Honor. The motion to continue is denied. <clears throat> Docket number CR56020, State of Tennessee versus Kenneth Wayne D. Hart Jr. <clears throat> Count one, first degree murder. Count two, attempted first degree murder. Count three, possession of a weapon by a convicted felon. State's ready to call your first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, very briefly beforehand, in regards to count three, the state has three exhibits that it will uh, seek to introduce at this time. First, a certified copy of a Class C felony aggravated assault conviction from 2003. I uh, have previously provided those to defense counsel, Your Honor. We'd ask that be Exhibit 1. Secondly, Your Honor, again, a certified copy of a conviction of the Class E felony of reckless endangerment involving a deadly weapon from 2006, Blount County Circuit Court. We'd seek to have entered as Exhibit 2. And then thirdly, Your Honor, a conviction from 2018 to a charge of aggravated assault, which was pled guilty to the lesser included offense of domestic assault uh, in Blount County Circuit Court in 2018. We seek that as Exhibit 3. May I please court? We have been given copies of these documents, and we will stipulate their admissibility for purposes of this hearing, but reserve the right to object 
uh, to their admission at trial if we get there, if circumstances should arise that way. Your Honor, with that, the state would call Deputy Shelby Eggers. <laughs> State your name, please. Shelby Eggers. And will you spell your last name for the record? E G G E R S. Thank you. And where are you employed? The Blount County Sheriff's Office. And what is your current position at the Blount County Sheriff's Office? Deputy Sheriff Assignment Patrol. And how long have you been with the Sheriff's Office? Almost five years. Have you held positions with the Sheriff's Office prior to going to patrol? Yes, sir. What are those? I worked in the jail. I worked in adult correction. Uh, when did you transition from corrections to patrol? In August of 2022. And did you have to undergo uh, certain training in order to make that transition to patrol? Yes, sir. What was that? I went through the patrol academy and the post academy. And how long is that? It's uh, 13 weeks. Okay. And when did uh, when did you start that and finish that? I began, in, I believe it was August 15th of 2022. I graduated in November 4th of 2022. And just in general, not specifically, what all does the academy cover? Um, essentially everything that you need to be a post-certified police officer in the state of Tennessee. All right. Now, once you completed the academy, do they just immediately release you on patrol by yourself, or is there additional training involved? No, sir. I had to go through 14 weeks of field training with a trained field training officer. And what does that entail, just briefly? Uh, basic patrol duties, responding to calls, traffic stops, welfare checks, property checks, things of that nature. And did you successfully complete that? Yes, sir. Uh, since uh, getting out on your own patrol and completing that, have you had any additional training that you've undergone regarding, you know, your patrol activities? Yes, sir. I attend 40 hours of in-service every year. I recently completed a class called ICAT. It's essentially a uh, version of CIT, which is Crisis Intervention Training. Okay. Now, Deputy Eggers, when you're on patrol, just in general, what are your job duties and responsibilities while you're on duty? Um, I respond to call, calls for service in my assigned zone or assigned zones. Um, I do regular patrol on the streets, whether that's traffic enforcement, talking to people, things of that nature. Right. Now, are there, uh, are there different shifts uh, that you all work while on patrol here at the Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. So we have a first, second, and third shift. We work 10-hour shifts. First shift is scheduled from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Evening shift, which is my assigned shift, is scheduled from 3 p.m. to 1 a.m. And night shift comes in at 8 p.m. and stays until 6 a.m. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned you mentioned zones. What are what are zones? How does that work with patrol? So we have four zones in Blount County. Blount County is split up basically into four quadrants. Uh, one and zones one and two are the south end zones of the county, and zones three and four are the north end zones. Of and while you're on patrol, is there a way you all handle backup, or how is backup handled if you need additional officers or assistance while you're on patrol? So our supervisors make our lineup and they assign us to a specific zone or set of zones. It's different every day. I don't work the same zone every day. Um, we'll have deputies assigned to each zone, and then we'll also have a county backup north, which covers the north end, zones three and four, as I mentioned just earlier, and um, a county backup south that covers zones one and two as I mentioned earlier. We also sometimes have county-wide backup, which will be backup for the entire county. Thank you. And if I could now please direct your attention to Thursday, February the 8th of 2024. Were you on duty on that date? Yes, sir. And I assume you were working, as you said, evening shift, second shift? Yes, sir. And did you have an assigned zone that day? Yes, sir. I was assigned to county zone three. And just in general, where is zone three? Seymour, Eagle, Ten Rock, for that area. Okay. And what was what was your backup situation on that night, third, uh, February the 8th? 
So with it being Thursday, we had more people there than normal. Those are training days for our specialty units. <clears throat> so I actually had a partner sign his own breed with me, Deputy Amanda Fritz. Um, we had a county backup north, and I can't recall who that was. Um, and then we had two county-wide backups who were Deputy Greg McCowan and Deputy Noel Bain. Right. While you were on duty, uh, on February the 8th, did you have reason to conduct a, a traffic stop on Sevierville Road? Yes, sir. And what type of vehicle was it that you stopped? It was a silver Lexus SUV. And do you know where on Sevierville Road this traffic stop occurred? It occurred in the 4900 block in between Keeble Road and Destiny Lane. And is that located in Blount County, Tennessee? Yes, sir. And do you know the approximate time of the traffic stop? Around 2,800 hours or 8 p.m. 8 p.m.? And what was it that caused you to stop that vehicle? Did you observe or see anything? Yes, so I came up behind the vehicle. Um, I first observed the vehicle swerving inside its lane, so it didn't cross the double yellow or the, the fog line. It was kind of just going back and forth. Then I observed the vehicle go left of center over the double yellow line just a little bit. It did that for a moment, and then I observed the vehicle go all the way left of the center line to where the driver's side front tire was almost touching the white fault line on the opposite side of the road. And is it that at that time that you activated your emergency lights? Yes. Okay. And did the vehicle stop? Yes. Where is it that it stopped initially? In the center of its lane on the road. And is that an ideal place for a traffic stop? Yes. Sir. Why is that? Um, it's not safe for me or the person I stopped. We can get rear-ended from behind by car. I can get hit by car out talking to them. So it's, it's, not, it's not an ideal location or safe location. So what did you do when the vehicle stopped in the middle of the road? I walked up to the driver's side of the window and I introduced myself to the driver as Shelby and told him that I worked for the Blount County Sheriff's Office and that I was going to ask him to pull into the driveway, which was just forward and to the left of uh, where he had stopped in the road. And did he do that initially? Sort of. He pulled up, then he pulled horizontally across the driveway that I'd asked him to pull into, stopped in the yard, and the vehicle was still partially, it was kind of sitting on the fog line, but my vehicle was still all the way in the right way. So what did you do then? I reapproached the vehicle again, spoke to the driver, and asked him to pull into the driveway, which was in front of the driveway that I formerly asked him to pull into and told him to pull in like he was going to the house. And did he do so? Yes. And that driveway is still located in Blount County, I believe? Yes. All right. At that point in time, did you approach the vehicle and have a more in-depth conversation with the driver? Yes. How many people were in that vehicle? Just one. Just one. And the driver of that vehicle, you know who that was? Yes. It who? was the defendant, Kenny Dagger. Could you please identify him here today? Yes, he's sitting in front of me. Thank you. Reflect the Thank you. Um, what did you do? Did you tell the defendant why you had stopped him? Yes, sir. What did you tell him? I told him, um, I, I introduced myself again, and I let him know that I'd stopped him because he was all over the roadway. All right. Now, to be fair, had you ever met uh, the defendant, Mr. Dehart, before this day? No, sir. Did you have any prior knowledge whatsoever of the defendant before this interaction? No, sir. What did the uh, defendant say in response when you told him why he had been stopped? He told me that he didn't realize that he had swerved. He was, had been pulling his hair back, and he may have swerved in that, but he was so sorry he didn't realize that he had swerved. Okay. Did you ask the defendant for his license, registration, proof of insurance, that sort of thing? Yes. And was he able to provide those? Yes. He was able to retrieve his wallet from the floor and pull his driver's license out of his wallet. Um, we were having a conversation, but he continually was talking. Um, so he was distracted a bit, and it took him a moment to find the uh, vehicle registration. Did, did that seem at all at odd to you or indicate anything to you or anything like that? He was maybe upset or nervous about something because he was continually talking. He did not stop talking from the time that I approached the window to the time that everything happened. All right. So you took his driver's license, correct? Yes, sir, and he did, handed me the vehicle registration. All right. Did you notice anything else or sense anything else at that time that caused you concern? Um, I observed the odor of marijuana at the driver's side window. All right. So based on that, you've got his driver's license. Where do you go from there? I go back to my vehicle so that I can check his driver's license status and see if he has any active warrants in any of local counties. And was his license valid? His license was valid. He did not have any active warrants. All right. What do you do uh, while you're in the vehicle at this time? Um, I made a phone call to Deputy McCowan, 
we had already spoken back and forth over the radio, and I knew he was on his way to me. Um, I called him on the phone just to give him a little bit more information of what I was dealing with. I let him know that I thought that I had an impaired driver and that I was possibly going to be doing um, SFSTs or standardized field sobriety tests with the driver. So from an investigatory purpose, you're going to extend this traffic stop uh, for what reasons based on your interaction with the defendant? In order to determine whether the, the defendant was safe to operate a motor, motor vehicle on a public roadway and to search the vehicle because of the other All right. Thank you. Did you eventually return to the vehicle, make contact with the defendant again? Yes. Now, how did you how did you approach the vehicle this second time? The second time, I made a passenger side approach. Um, it gave me a bit more of a tactical advantage. My eyebrows were kind of raised based off of his. Uh, just he he seemed to be nervous, um, so I made a passenger side approach as kind of an element of surprise. At this point, are you yelling at the defendant or anything like that? No, sir. All right. Did you tell the defendant sort of uh, what your plan was from an investigation standpoint? Yes, sir. What did you tell him? I let him know that I needed him to step out of the vehicle in order for me to search it, and I let him know also that I had probable cause to search it due to the odor of marijuana. And how did he respond to that? He was not very happy about it. He became more defiant, I guess, defensive. All right. Uh, and at this point in time, is he on the phone with anyone that you could tell? Yes, he was on the phone with, I believe, his grandmother. All right. And what what conversation? Did you have conversation with the grandmother? I did. Originally, the grandmother and I and the defendant talked back and forth about the insurance. Um, he was searching for the proof of insurance and the insurance cards. Um, and she was the owner of the vehicle, so she was reassuring me over the phone. She did have insurance. and. She must have just not put the new card in there. So we talked about that, and then I also explained to her why I needed to get the defendant to sit by the And let me ask you, so was it pretty common for you to have asked Deputy McCowan to join you at this traffic stop? Was, would that be out of the ordinary at all? No, typically any time a deputy makes a traffic stop, it's not necessarily that we have to ask for backup. Somebody always, we work with each other well enough to know that if somebody makes a traffic stop, somebody is going to try to back them up. Whoever's closest will come within just as a measure of caution. All right. So were you able to convince the defendant to exit the vehicle voluntarily? No, sir. Did you continue to request him to do so? Yes, sir. And how did that conversation go? Um, I continued to kind of plead with him and ask him to get out of the vehicle. And I also let him know eventually after talking to him for a few minutes, that if he did not willingly step out of the vehicle, that I was going to have to forcibly remove him from the vehicle. All right. Did uh, I mean, let me ask you this: How how big in your in your mind was the defendant? You know, what what? How would you describe him? I couldn't tell his height because he was seen in the vehicle, but probably two or three times my size. He was he's a bigger guy. Yeah. Did Deputy McCowan uh, eventually arrive on scene? Yes. And where did he park? He parked his cruiser almost. Parallel to mine. And how did he approach the vehicle of the defendant that, where you were talking with him at? He made a driver's side approach. All right. And what did you do as Deputy McCowan approached the driver's side? Um, after Deputy McCowan began speaking with the defendant, I walked in between the defendant's car and my patrol mm -hmm. vehicle and stood next to De Deputy McCowan, sort of towards the B panel of the vehicle. And what, what is your conversation with the defendant like at this point? I continually ask him to get out of the vehicle. I tell him this is his last chance. He's going to have to step out of the vehicle or I'm going to have to pull him out. And uh, then we open the door and I attempted to get a seat. So what is your what is your first uh, plan of action regarding removing him from the vehicle? Um, I plan to go hands on. Um, if, if I can use that approach, I like to. Um, so my plan was to put my arm up sort of right about here. I guess it's easy to put this on. Right about here so that I could hold him back from folding over the seat belt and then reach across and undub with him to pull him out of the vehicle. And were you able to successfully do that? No, sir. And why not? Um, he was able to grab a hold of my forearms and we just kind of tussled. So he fought you off from unbuckling him, basically? Yes. All right. So now that the uh, use of hands um, approach has failed, what is what is the next approach you, you all decide to take? Uh, Deputy McCallum draws his taser. And is there additional conversation with the defendant at this time? Yes, I informed the defendant that he did not step out of the vehicle. And how did he respond to that? He was not going to step out of the vehicle. All right. And eventually, uh, did you observe that taser being deployed? Yes. 
What happened when the taser was deployed? Uh, that, so in the tasers that we carry, we have two sets of probes. Uh, two probes are deployed um, when the taser is fired. So um, Deputy McCown deployed his taser. Two probes were deployed, and Mr. DeHart was able to pull those probes out by the box. So it was a, a bad contact upon initial deployment? Yes. All right. What, what occurred after the bad contact? Um, as soon as they were pulled out, uh, essentially as soon as Deputy McCown fired the taser, the probes were pulled out by Mr. DeHart, and then um, Deputy McCown fired his second set of probes, and they made a good contact. All right. And in conjunction with the second set of probes contacting the defendant, was the defendant doing anything? He locked up Okay. And so you have a good contact. Uh, so the taser is now effective. What is what is your plan as far as extracting the defendant from the vehicle? So I still have to remove his seatbelt at some point so that I can pull him out of the vehicle. So what did you do? So um, while the taser was being deployed and he was incapacitated, uh, I forgot to add that I believe Mr. DeHart shut the door after the first bad contact with the taser. The door was shut. Um, when I went in, I still had to get a seatbelt off, get him out, so I opened the door while the taser was being deployed, um, reached in to grab the seatbelt, and I got wrapped up in the wire, so I got tased as well, and I was fully incapacitated. So you were feeling the effects of the taser as well as Mr. DeHart? Yes. All right. Once, uh, how long does a taser typically go for? Five seconds. All right. Once that five seconds was up, what did you do? Um, I stepped away from the vehicle to kind of gather my composure and catch my breath. Um, and Deputy McCowan continued to deal with it again. All right. Did Deputy McCowan eventually reposition himself? As soon as I stepped back from the vehicle, Deputy McCowan repositioned himself to where he was sort of standing diagonally facing the defendant. But he was, uh, his body was sort of next to the driver's side mirror. And did something occur at that point in time? Yes. What, what was that? I was shot and so was Deputy County. Did you see what had happened? I was on the ground. All, all I heard was the gunshots. I didn't ever see the gun being pulled out. All right. Um, do you know, where were you shot? In the leg. And what was, what was going through your mind at this time? Um, I didn't know where I had been shot in the leg. I just felt pain in my right thigh. I knew it was somewhere in my thigh. Um, I fell to the ground immediately and everything kind of moved slow motion. Um, I couldn't get myself up and I thought, I, I took a breath and I accepted death because I thought he was going to fire at me again. He, he, had a, he had an advantage over me. He could have shot me back in the head. I thought he was were you uh, eventually able to get back on your feet? Yes. All right. uh, where was the defendant when you were doing this? He was still in the driver side of the vehicle. Once you got back on your feet, where did you go? Uh, I ran behind Deputy McCallum's car and drew my service weapon. All right. Is he still um, is he still the car motionless at this point, or has he started to move? Uh, I believe he had started to move when I was at the back of the vehicle pulling my gun out, and he drove around the tree in the yard and drove through the yard to, to exit. All right, and what did you do as, he, as he's pulling around? Is he driving back towards you at this point? He wasn't driving. Well, he was driving back towards my direction, but not at me. Okay. Um, he was driving back towards Silver River Road, going towards, kind of diagonally towards Silver River Road, and ended up turning right to go back towards Maryville. But what did you do as he was passing you? Um, I moved up to the front of Deputy McCown's vehicle so I could have a good vantage point. I fired three rounds from my service weapon, and um, he turned right on the Silverville Road, the way we were facing. Um, he turned right on the Silverville Road, and I still had my gun out, but I knew that I couldn't shoot anymore because I had a lot of cars, and I didn't want to get in any more danger. So you fired the three as he's heading towards the Silverville Road, but chose not to, to shoot additional rounds because there's, there's other traffic there, basically. Right. All right. Uh, Deputy, was your cruiser equipped with a dash cam video? Yes. And were you likewise equipped with a body-worn camera? Yes. And do you know if Deputy McCowan's cruiser was equipped with a dash cam video? Yes. And do you know if he was equipped with a body-worn camera? Yes. 
And have you previously reviewed all four of those videos? Yes, sir. And did those videos fairly and accurately represent the events that occurred that night? Yes, sir. Parent, at this time, I'm going to ask to play those videos. You can't see your driver's license 
next to each other. <laughs> It 
doesn't hit on me. I'm telling you. Okay, I didn't say you did, brother. Okay, you're not saying I said it smells like weed in your car. I have a problem with cause to search your car. Can you step out for me? Step out for me. No, I'm not. Baby. The police got me pulled over. They threatened me to get out the car. I'm not getting out the car. Can you just get out the car, man? I'm not trying to make this difficult. You are making it difficult. I'm not making it difficult. I'm not being racist. I'm asking you. I don't have a dog, sir. Tell these folks I don't smoke weed. You don't smoke weed. Okay. I didn't say you smoke weed. I don't smoke weed. I never accuse you of smoking weed. You said I got to get out this car. I'm not. I'm confusing. Yeah, I am saying you have to get out of the car. I'm refusing it. You can't refuse to search. I have a problem with dogs. That's how the law works, No, it don't. That's how the law works, brother. Where are you? I'm down here on Suburban Road, baby. Like, this is not right, man. I'm really not doing nothing wrong. I'm really all my You're on the wrong side of the road, brother. Right? You're on the wrong side of the road. That's why I stopped you. I ain't doing nothing wrong. Can you manage this? You get out of the car, brother. I'm not getting out. I'm not getting out of the car. 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 You could have just gave me a ticket and said, you know, I don't smoke. I don't have a dog to search your car. Well, I do not have a dog. I can't help you there. Search. You know, I'd like to have a dog. I don't have a dog. Down here, baby. I'm on some river road, baby. Just talk down some river road like 10 minutes. I just need you to step out the car, baby. I'm refusing to search. Okay, so, so here's what's going to happen if you don't step out of the car. We're going to have to drive you out of the car, and then you're going to go to jail. So you can either step out of the car, or I can pull you out of the car. You can you can step out the car and I'm pulling you out of the car. She asked you she I, I, she asked you to get out of the car. Get out of the car, bro. I said it smells like weed. I need you to get a dog, please. No, we don't. We don't have to have a dog. Get a dog. It smells like weed. Get out of the car. I'm gonna tell you one more time. Can you get out of the car? I can't, ma'am. You can't. I'm recording this. Okay, you can record it. That's fine. I'm recording too. I recorded this whole interaction. Go and get out of the car. You were on the wrong side of the road, kid. I was not on the wrong side of the road. You were on the wrong side of the road, bro. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. No, no, don't touch my car. Get out of the car.
collection of videos be entered as exhibit number four, please? Uh, Deputy Eggers, how many times were you shot? And how many uh, exit wounds did you have from that shot? I have uh, three wounds. I have an entrance wound down towards my right knee and two exit wounds on my on the outside of my upper right thigh. Deputy Eggers, thank you. Pass the witness. Thank you. I'm Matt Garner, the Public Defender's Office. Mr. Elrod and I have been appointed to represent Mr. DeHart. Um, I know these are disturbing questions. I, I'm simply trying to find out the details of various things that happened. Uh, some of my questions may seem a little foolish, but I'm legally blind and I can't always tell from the films what happened and I can't drive. So some of these questions relate to that. Uh, where were you headed that night on Sevierville Road? Um, I was headed back towards town. It was actually close to um, evening just dinner break, so I was going to visit somebody. So you were just on a routine patrol? Yes. Sir. What brought your attention to the vehicle that Mr. DeHart was driving? The way he was driving. Can you describe it for us, please? Yes, so um, the video is the best example, but um, I witnessed the vehicle swerving within its lane, and then I witnessed the vehicle go left of center just a little bit, and then after a few minutes of it going back and forth doing that, I witnessed the vehicle go all the way to the opposite side of the road where the driver's side tire was close to the fog line on the opposite side of the road. Was there other traffic around at that time? Yes, sir, there were cars coming in the opposite direction. So was his driving endangering other people in your opinion or not? Yes, sir. I take it you have been trained in uh, stops for, for driving under the influence? Yes, sir. Can you tell us some of the signs of a person's driving that indicates he might be driving under the influence? Um, going slower than usual, maybe under the speed limit, um, not being able to maintain their own. Uh, so, at that point, you decided to stop this vehicle. Yes, Why? Because of him going left of center. Okay. At that point, did you you think he might be intoxicated, or were you simply worried that he was endangering other drivers and violating the law? Both. Okay. So, when you came up to him. We could see it on the video, but one thing we can't tell is you said on the video more than once that you smelled marijuana coming from somewhere in the vehicle. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Could you tell if that smell aroma was coming from Mr. DeHard or simply the vehicle in general? No, sir. Just, it, it could have been from Mr. DeHard or the vehicle in general. But you, you didn't know? But how strong was the odor? Strong enough for me to notice it. You've already testified that you have been trained in, in DUI arrests. What signs on a person are there that they've been intoxicated? Um, you can tell a lot by the eyes most of the time. Um, I did not tell very much by Mr. DeHart's eyes. Um, to be honest, I wasn't focused on his eyes, I was focused on his hands, his movements, things of that nature. Um, but their behavior, the way they act, the way they speak, um, sometimes if they're under the influence of some type of depressant, they're going to speak slower, have slurred speech. Um, however, Mr. DeHart seemed very excited. Um, he seemed nervous about something um, and was immediately pretty defensive. So you couldn't tell anything from his eyes? And you couldn't tell anything from his complexion, obviously. And that's, that's one of the things you look at, isn't it? His complexion? Yeah. I'm, if, if, maybe if his cheeks are flushed? If it's flushed, but you can't tell Mr. DeHart because he's so dark, I take it. Uh, you'd never seen Mr. DeHart before? No, sir. So I take it you couldn't tell one way or the other if his speech was slurred? No, sir. 
at what point during that video did you decide that he was probably under the influence? Um, as soon as, not the first contact that I had with him, but after we got the vehicle's position safely, uh, when I began to talk to him, I thought that he may be impaired. Just, just off of the way he was acting, he was very erratic, very excited about something. Okay, so based upon the smell of marijuana, the erratic driving, and the nervous, excited way that he was behaving, you thought at that point he might be under the influence? Yes, sir. Now, what is the, the regular thing that you do when you determine a driver's under the influence? Um, I try to talk to them, ask them you know, where they've been, where they're coming from, if they've had anything to drink, any parent drugs, anything like that. I like to be straightforward about that because a lot of times people will be honest. Um, Another thing is uh, pulling the person out of the car to perform standardized field sobriety tests. Did you form an opinion as to whether Mr. DeHart was being honest with you when, when you were talking with him when he was inside the car? No. And I didn't have an opinion of whether he was being honest with me or not. But you did think he might be under the influence? Yes, sir. So it was your intention that he get out of the car so that he undergo like the one leg stand and the walk and turn and those standardized field sobriety tests. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. And he refused to do that. Yes, sir. It looked like that you continued to interact with Mr. DeHart for what, four or five minutes maybe until Officer McGowan arrived? Yes. Now, can you explain to me how a taser works, what it is, and, and how you operate it and what it does? So the simplest explanation I can give you is um, the, there are probes. There are two probes fired out the end of the taser. Those probes make contact with wherever they hit on your body with Mr. heart. It was <clears throat> chest, stomach area. Um, and those... <clears throat> There are wires connected to those probes that send electric signals through the wires into the person's body. And it has different effects on some people than others. For me, personally, it completely incapacitates me. It incapacitates me and it hurts. Um, it hurts. It feels like your muscles are trying to jump out of your body is the way that I would describe it. So, <clears throat> basically, it, it's a gun-like thing that shoots these wires with the probes on the end. Yes, it's a less, less lethal device. All right. And... If I could tell right from the video, that was used twice? Three times. Three times, all right. What happened after the first use of the taser? So when the taser probes were, when the first set of probes was fired from Deputy McCowan's taser, Mr. DeHart was able to grab the wires and pull the wires out, so it did not have an effect on him. However, Deputy McCowan fired his second set of probes from his taser, which made contact with him and successfully incapacitated Mr. DeHart. And Mr. DeHart was wearing a seatbelt, correct? Yes. So it, you couldn't just pull him out without having to undo the belt? Correct. Okay. So uh, what happened after the third deployment of the taser? So during the second deployment of the taser, um, I attempted to get inside the car and take Mr. DeHart's seatbelt off of him so that I could pull him out while he was incapacitated so he wouldn't be fighting against me. Um, and I got wrapped, my arm got wrapped up in the taser wire, and so I was as well incapacitated. All right, so the, the taser had to be deployed again? Yes. All right. After you got incapacitated, if I understood your testimony correctly, you went from the side of Mr. DeHart's car over to Deputy McGowan's car. Is that right? I was sort of, I was facing, I was right next to Mr. DeHart when my legs were touching. I was right in front of him. And once the five second cycle of the taser was over, the, the one where I was incapacitated as well, I took a step back and I stepped sort of behind Deputy McGowan. He was standing facing the driver, and he repositioned himself to where he was facing the driver diagonally, and his body would sort of be in line with the driver's side mirror. So he was kind of in front of Mr. McCowan toward the front of the car beside the mirror? Yes. Is that Mr. right? Mr. DeHart was still in the vehicle. Okay, and where were you at that point? I was, 
I would say in line with the bead killer, but I'd step back a couple of feet because I stepped back to gain, regain my composure so that I could get back in it. So you would have been what, eight or ten feet away maybe or something like that? Probably not even that far, maybe four to five. I don't <coughs> four to five feet from the bead killer. I understand you're just making an estimate and this happened very fast. And Did you see Mr. DeHart pull his gun out? No, sir. I heard the gunshots and I was immediately on the ground. So you don't know, you had not seen the gun before? No. And you don't know where it, you didn't know where it came from? No. It, it came from inside the vehicle, but I don't know where in the vehicle Do you know, what, how many shots were fired? I, I heard several in a very short period of time. It sounded like three. Does that sound right to you, or, or is that not right? I believe it was five. Okay. Do you know which shot hit you? The first one. The very first shot, right? Do you know which shot hit Deputy McGowan, or were you able to see? I was not able to see. I believe it was the second and third one, but I did not see on scene. So, I mean, I take it. A shot like that, if it hits you in the knee, you just fall down totally unable to can't see anything else, basically. Is that right? Yeah. When I got hit, my body kind of turned where my back was facing the vehicle, so I, I kind of turned and fell to the ground. So my, my back was to everything happened. I, I, I guess it's been a year or two ago. I fell and tore up the tendon in my knee, and I just remember being on the ground and not able to see or think about much of anything except what had happened to me. So did, did you actually see much of anything happen from then on? I heard everything happening. I was eventually able to gain my composure, get back on my feet, and uh, do as I was trained to do. Uh, I could not see everything happening behind me. I got out, I ran behind up in the and then I was able to see everything. But and at, at that point, off Deputy McGowan was on the ground. Yes. Uh, so, you you talked to your partner. Was your partner still in the car during all this? Didn't Didn't you say you were riding with somebody? No. When I was saying my partner in the video, I was referring to Deputy McGowan. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sir. sorry. Uh, so you called dispatch and they sent someone and see. For what it's worth, Deputy, I have no further questions, but I thought you handled a difficult situation very well. Is there only redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. Uh, Agent Maria Cutshaw. Come up, please. <laughs> Let me read this word. Psalms were all referring to testimony to the truth, the whole truth, and that's the truth. I do. Please. Being recorded, screwed up the bus. Agent Cutshaw, if you would uh, spell your first and last name for us. M-A-R-I-A, C-U-T-S-H-A-W. Where do you work? I'm employed at the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. What's your job there? I'm a special agent. All right, what kind of law enforcement experience and background do you have in training? I've been in law enforcement for 23 years. Uh, I have an associate's, <clears throat> bachelor's, and master's degree in the criminal justice field. 
had multiple trainings throughout the years in, this, in my career. And how long have you been with the TBI? Seven years. And what are your job responsibilities as an agent with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation? We conduct uh, investigations on basically any type of criminal activity that we're request requested to. How did you become involved in this particular case? I uh, received a call from the assistant special agent in charge the evening of the 8th, around 8.50 p.m., and requested that I report to the scene. He had been requested by the district attorney, uh, Ryan Desmond. And do you know why it was the TBI was requested to assist in, in handling this investigation? We're often requested in, in death cases, and especially we work most all uh, officer involved shootings in the state. And obviously we have a, an officer involved shooting in this particular instance, right? That is correct. Um, so did you respond out to the scene there on Sevierville Road that night? I did. And what were you doing that night specifically? That night, uh, we... There were several agents that were called out. Uh, we did different tasks, and what I did was I interviewed uh, three of the people that were in the vehicles uh, that were sort of in line from traffic, and uh, that was one of the first things I did after trying to gather some preliminary information and uh, uh, obtaining some of the uh, deputies. Okay. And in fact, uh, let me ask, you're the lead investigator in this particular case. I am. But you're not the only person from the TBI that was working that night or had been working during the manhunt either, Absolutely right? Absolutely not. How many would you say? Just Dozens. Okay. And in fact, you all split some job responsibilities in terms of interviewing various people. Absolutely. So you said you'd interviewed three that night. Do you remember who it was you interviewed? Uh, the scene witnesses that I interviewed was Elijah Tarwater, who was the homeowner of the residence which driveway this, this incident occurred in at 4953 Central Road, uh, Leslie Richardson, and a Jose Lewis. And Mr. Lewis is not an English speaker, right? He was not. Did you have some assistance in interviewing him? I did. I used a translator. And the, the two people who were depicted, you've seen the videos uh, even before today? Yes, I saw them that night. Okay. Um, the two people who are depicted, I guess the Good Samaritans that are that are there, that are assisting, that are on the video, those are not, you didn't interview the two of them. I did not another agent interview them. But they, they were interviewed by, it was a TBI agent? Yes. Okay. Um, do you do you know, as a part of y'all's investigation, uh, were, were shell casings recovered? From the scene? Mm -hmm. Yes. How many were recovered, you know? Let, let me know that I did not work the crime scene. I have seen an ongoing list of the evidence recovered. Where is it? The evidence that has been recovered, where is it located? It's in the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation okay. Office. All right. What was recovered in terms of shell casings? Uh, we recovered in total six 40 caliber spent shell casings and two 9 millimeter spent shell casings and two live 9 millimeter Ca uh, shells. Cool. They were live rounds. Okay. Um, as it relates to Deputy Egger's weapon. What, what kind of weapon did she have? She, uh, she and both uh, Deputy McAllen carried a Glock 45 model, mm -hmm. which is a 9 millimeter weapon. Okay. So the 9 millimeter casings and live rounds that you recovered, that matches the calibers that would have been used in that weapon. That is correct. And then the other, the, the uh, 40 caliber shell casings you recovered, have we recovered any type of 40 uh, gun that would have been shooting that type of weapon? Or excuse me, that type of ammunition? There have been several guns recovered in this case. There have been several search warrants executed mm -hmm. at different locations, and there have been um, there have been four. I know uh, there have been a gun and a box of a forty that was recovered in different locations. Okay, do you remember where those were recovered from? Um, I know that the box of the forty caliber uh, was at the Carrie Matthews residence, and. The, there was a, I believe there was one found at the Linden Avenue address where he was arrested on the 13th. Okay. And you've mentioned Carrie Matthews. Who is Carrie Matthews in this, as it relates to this particular case? He's the fiance, or she, I'm sorry, she's the fiance of, of Mr. DeHart. Okay. Um, that particular night when you responded out there, did you have a chance to speak to uh, or go to the hospital where Deputy Eggers was at you know, uh, UT? I did not speak with her that night, another agent did. Okay. And she was then subsequently interviewed by the TBI later for a lengthier interview, I believe. That's correct. Were you a participant in that interview? I was not. Did you respond to uh, 
I believe Deputy McCallum was taken to Blount Memorial Hospital. Did you respond to, the, to that hospital that night? I did not. He had already been uh, pronounced deceased. Okay. Um, did you attend the autopsy of Deputy McCallum? I did. If you could, where was that? Where was that conducted? The Knox County Regional Forensic Center. Who conducted that autopsy? Dr. Dorinka Malusi. All right. Uh, were you present for that? I was. Were you able to observe what kind of, uh, if any, gunshot wounds were present on uh, Deputy McCown's body? I did see gunshot wounds on his body. Yes. Could you tell us and describe for us, for the court reporter here? Could you describe where those wounds were located? There was one on his right side on his right side, but if you were looking at him, it would have been to the right side of his nipple. And there was also one on his left lower abdomen. So that's those two gunshot wounds. Did you see any other injuries? There, there were other wounds that, that were on his body, yes. Okay. Um, were there anything, was there anything recovered from inside his body? There were two intact uh, projectiles that were where are those now? At the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Are those being examined? They will be, yes. And do we have any test results on those yet? We have no test results on anything at this point. Okay. Now, I know this, the, uh, the search for the defendant went on for a, for a prolonged period of time before he was located, I guess five days, right? Yes. And during the pendency of that time, did, was the Lexus that's depicted in the video, was it located? It was. Do you, do you know where that, when that was located? It was located later that night. The address, I believe, is 4102 Franklin Hill Road. Is that here in Blount County? It is. Uh, was he in it? He was not. Okay. Do you know uh, who processed, was it processed? It was processed. Who processed that vehicle? Another agent at TBI. All right. And where is the vehicle now? It is at the Tennessee Bureau Investigation. Okay. Do you know if anything was recovered from inside that vehicle? There, I know that there were several things that were recovered. Uh, one <coughs> thing that I have mentally noted are the uh, 40 caliber uh, unfired bullets, a uh, nine millimeter magazine, fired projectile, taser probes and wires, and shotgun shells. Okay. Was that uh, vehicle, did you observe or do you know if there were bullet holes in that vehicle? I know that there were. I don't feel comfortable testifying how many as I was not there for uh, the vehicle processing. Okay. All right. uh, were you present uh, once the defendant was taken into custody, did you have an opportunity to see him? Um, once he was taken into custody? I did. Once he was taken uh, to the Blount County Jail, he was immediately taken up. For, after he was booked in and processed, he was immediately taken up to their detective division in an interview room. And did you go to that interview room? I did. Were you there by yourself? I was with another agent. Who, which agent was that? Special Agent Brandon Elkins. Did the two of you attempt to interview the defendant that that I guess it was that day? We did. How did that go? Um, he immediately stated that he would like to have an attorney present. Did he make any other statements? He, he made a few statements. Uh, no questions were asked. He, he made a couple statements initially that he regretted uh, not staying at the ball game with his son, and he regretted turning down that road. Did he get he regretted shooting the officers? He did not make that statement. That's all I have right now, Agent. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Agent Cutshaw, my name is Matthew Elrod. I'm one of the assistant public defenders here in Blount County. If if I ask a question that you're unsure of or that you don't hear clearly, please just stop me or get my attention, and I'll repeat myself, or we can we can go back and clarify what needs to be clarified. Um, first, I want to talk about I, I couldn't help but notice during the during your examination by. General Jenkins, I assume that you have notes that you're referencing or, lo or looking at to, to uh, refresh your memory. Uh, are those notes that, that you've made and reports that you've made in the course of this investigation? Those were notes that I have made in the last day, sure. just, just for court purposes. Okay. Uh, within the last day or two or over the course of a couple of days that, you, that you've been making those notes? Since last night. Okay. That's something that you did, though? Yes. Okay. That's something... You prepared because you wanted to make sure your memory was correct and recalling things being asked here in court, correct? That is correct. Okay. And without them, it goes without saying that uh, sometimes we need to write down notes to jog our memory to make sure we accurately and, and truthfully tell a fact or recall a fact, correct? Yes. 
Okay. And so without those, you would have been uh, at a disadvantage or you wouldn't necessarily been able to do that a hundred percent, you thought? That's possible. Okay. Your Honor, uh, pursuant to 80 rules of evidence 803, uh, number five, recorded recollection, as an adverse party, I'd ask that the notes that she's been referring to in her testimony be admitted uh, into evidence. I know the rule asks, and we're allowed to recite that and read that into the record. I'm not asking to do that now, but I do want to make that as, an, as defense exhibit one. We're not objecting, Your Honor. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And let's, let's talk about, I'll try to keep this in, in order uh, from what we've seen on the video, what uh, Deputy Eggers has, has discussed with us this morning. Um, we know the original, we know the reason for the stop. We know where it was stopped at. We know that Mr. D. Hart was a, was a suspect and looks like it was an ongoing DUI investigation. That's accurate? According to the video, yes. Um, and according to her test, you've been That's present right. here for her testimony. Uh, she believes she had a, a likely impaired driver from things according to her training and experience that she's seen that she was worried that she had somebody that might have been using or been intoxicated by some substance. Um, we didn't hear anything about alcohol being detected, but she, she was concerned that marijuana was detected, right? That's what she said. Okay. Um, do you know, uh, talking, uh, and this question might be better for talking about this stop, we saw in the video that the deputy, um, in doing some record checks and checking his driver's license status and checking his uh, um, background or his warrant check, um, I'm assuming she used not only dispatch by radio means, but also she has access to databases and portals that might allow her to look and see if this gentleman is either wanted or what his license status is. Is that accurate? Sure. Okay. Um, do you know if those materials or those devices, I, I take it using her phone, the, the dispatch with the radio, I know those are recorded. But with regard to her computer or her phone, if she's using those items as record checks, is that something that y'all ordinarily would take into evidence or is that something that you all have forensically gotten a copy of? We will. Okay, you will. So that you've not had a chance maybe to do that personally yourself, but it's in the process? Yes, a lot of the items, well, most of the items have not been tested. Sure. Or forensically examined at this point. It's still very early on. Right. Um, many search warrants will have to be written to do those things. Um, but those will be done. Gotcha. Um, and do you know if, um, um, I take it the same would, would stand as true for Deputy McCowan's, those items that, uh, belonging to him or issued to him by the department, if he were to be using those? When I'm not sure what he was or wasn't using that night, um, but those items would likewise be somewhere held and collected to review if, if needed? Yes. Okay. Um, You said that you've had 23 years, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, as a law enforcement officer, seven of which has been with the TBI. Before that, were you in a local or a sheriff's department, a city police? I worked both at the city and a county. Okay, where, where were those agencies? The city of Sevierville. Okay. That's where I began my career in 2001. Gotcha. So 2004. In 2004, I became a deputy at the Sevier County Sheriff's Office. Gotcha. Okay. So you've seen, you've seen a whole lot of things and done a whole lot of things in, in your 23-year career. Um, there was some discussion, and we've seen, it, we've seen the use of the electronic control device or the taser. Do you know what model taser we're talking about? I believe it's a 7, but I would want to certainly reflect to the, the evidence. Gotcha. So do you think... I do you, not have that noted. Sure, that's okay. Uh, and if you don't recall, that's fine. Let me know. Uh, do you know the brand name? Was it an Axon, or do you know the brand name of the Taser? I believe it's Taser. Okay, that's. You think that's the that's the actual name of it? Okay. Uh, and is that? I know that you said that Deputy McCown and Deputy um, Eggers' firearms were taken, and that's being held by the Bureau of Investigation for testing um, and for evidence purposes. Were were any Tasers, and specifically Deputy McCowan's Taser? Was that something that you all have in in evidence? As well? Yes. Okay. Do you know if, is this a model that um, I think a lot of them, when they're fired, when they deploy those darts or those probes, 
ID tags come out. Yes. Is this one that does the same? Yes. Okay, so it essentially fingerprints what gun fired that specific probe or, or set of probes. Yes, it gives a time. Uh, I believe it gives a time date. There's a report that will be generated from those Sure, that was my next question. I think that in some way or fashion, either you can download it from the device itself or the tags seem to suggest a, di a date and time stamp of when that thing is fired, when it's been used. Is there also, are you aware of, does that device tell you how many times it was activated? So, and, and I'll make sure my question's clear. The probes are fired, as Deputy Eggers has said. They didn't. They didn't get the, the the reaction they needed to as far as incapacitation of Mr. DeHart. Uh, fires again. The darts make good contact, like the deputy said. And then there's a couple of occasions where the five second bursts are being used. That you would agree with that. Yes. Um, is there something inside the device, or are there something? Is there something that some you said it, it, it gives a report that tells us how many times in the duration of those usages or the report should generate uh, how many cartridges were deployed as well as how many electric shots. Okay, all right. Uh, what, and, and I guess I should probably ask this too, in your law enforcement career and with any of these agencies that you've, you've been with, you're familiar with those devices, those control, the, the control devices, a taser? I'm somewhat familiar with them. Okay. Have, have you ever been trained with them or have you ever been uh, uh, de deployed or uh, used one yourself? I have, uh, but it's been 20 years. Sure, I understand. I understand. Um, but that's something that you, at, the point, at that point in time, and I'll try to keep it pretty simple with my questions about it. Um, what is it designed to do? Just, and, and I'm not looking for a scientific explanation. If you've got one, I'd love to hear it. But I'm just wanting to know, what is it designed to do? Okay. Because, I like I said, it's been 20 years since I've had the training. Okay. Uh, so you, you don't remember why you were issued that specific weapon in your, in your, uh, during your duty as a law enforcement officer? It was used as a less than lethal device. Sure. That, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, and is it, you would agree with me that it's being used as a device to get somebody compliant, make somebody do something that they're unwilling or shown unwilling to do? Yes. Okay. And that's used, and I think Deputy Egger said her, her personal uh, experience with it is it incapacitates, it freezes you, and it hurts. Yes. Okay, that, we understand that. That's something that you can recall, that those, those are things that the, that the device does, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you remember in training, and it's okay if you don't remember, just let us know, um, were there individuals that, you, that were suggested you don't use it on or you do use it on, scenarios that play out that you might want to take extra caution to, before you use that device? I did not recall. Okay. Um, do you know or do you remember if there were any cautions or concerns in your training about its repeated use or extended use, meaning more than one time, more than two times, more than three times? Do you remember anything about that? I do not. Sure. Um, and so, and like you stated, it's early in an investigation. Do you all have an approximate um, or anything that's been measured out as far as that you've heard from other agents or yourself in relation to how far away that these shots from the taser were, were made or done or where uh, or later on have you determined where on Mr. DeHart's body that those darts actually made contact? We have not determined that. Okay. Um, do you know if he, when he was brought into custody, do you know if pictures were taken of Mr. DeHart? They were taken by the jail staff. Okay. Specifically by the Blount County Sheriff's Office, not necessarily TBI agents. Correct. Okay. Um, and after that original, you know, booking, any, any attempts at trying to get any pictures or anything like that of, of Mr. DeHart? Okay. Um, You stated a little bit ago that uh, some of the things that were recovered at the scene were six total, and I believe you said these are spent 40 caliber 
cartridges, uh, shell casings, correct? Yes. Six total of those. Uh, you also recovered two nine millimeter caliber uh, spent shell casings and two live rounds, same nine millimeter. Yes. Okay. Um, it's o and it's okay. I don't expect you to remember this. It, do you? Ha I mean, were there brands on there? There's stamp brands on the shell casings. There were, but I, I don't have the evidence list. Sure. Me. It's okay. Um, those are all in evidence. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and I know you stated that you didn't personally work the crime scene. Do you know if any agents have thus far or are continuing to work on trying to retrieve actual the, the lead round or the, the metal round? I won't necessarily say it's all lead. Some of them are a combination of different metals. But have there been any of those rounds, the actual projectile recovered from, the, from that scene? From the scene, no. There was one recovered in the Lexus, and there were two recovered in Okay. Do you know the caliber of those rounds that were the ones that you've located, those the actual projectiles? I do not at this point. That's still being tested by the Bureau of Investigation? That's correct. Okay. Um, you stated that uh, the, the deputies both were issued Glock Model 45 9mm, and you stated that there have been, I think you said that there's been several weapons seized or taken into as evidence um, in trying to determine and test test those things. How many weapons did you say in total that you all have collected thus far? I don't have that number. More than one? Yes. Okay. Um, and that was a, that was according to search warrants that you all have had issued um, through, I guess, you and other agents as well? Yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> Do you do you recall what residences those search warrants, other than Miss Matthews, you stated that was one, uh, was a search warrant issued for the Hemlock address in, in Alcoa? There was. Okay. Uh, do you know if anything was recovered there? I don't have that list. Okay. Uh, but you do recall that the, there was a 40 caliber box, and what else did you say that was recovered at Miss Matthews' address? Well, what I have written down, this is not the complete list. Sure, sure, I understand. This is, uh, from Terry Matthews' residence. Pistol and then the 40 caliber pistol box. Okay. Do you know what brand the pistol box that belonged to? I believe it's a Smith and Wesson. Okay. Um, but the box led you to believe it's it, at one point in time enclosed a, a 40 caliber pistol. I'm sure it originally did. Right. Right. Um, And I know that you stated that the rounds were recovered uh, from Deputy McCowan. Also, d d were the, was the round or rounds recovered from Deputy Eggers, her wound? Do you know? They were not recovered. Oh, okay. Um, do you know, I think you stated that the Lexus rounds were recovered from that, uh, from that vehicle as well. Where was it located or finally recovered or located? Do you know? I did not process that vehicle. Okay. Um, but TBI agents recovered that vehicle? That's correct. Okay. Do you, you don't, you know, and was it located within the state? I'm not asking for a specific address, but do you know, was it located in Tennessee? Alexis? Yes. yes. Okay. You stated that three individuals that you, um, that you interviewed, uh, Mr. Tarwater, I believe Ms. Richardson and Mr. Luis, those are individuals that were in the line of cars at, at some point in time during the during this incident. Yes. Okay. Uh, are those, do you know if those people are, are local residents or are they p just passing through? They're with the Tennessee. Okay. And did you record those statements that you that you uh, or your discussions with them, your interviews with them? Yes. Okay, those are recorded. Uh, do you know if with the other individuals that were interviewed, both the, the citizens that stopped by to help the deputies at the scene, as well as further interviews that the agents, have, special agents have done, are those normally recorded? They are. Okay. Um, so it'd be, it would be a surprise or would be against policy or be out of the ordinary for those interviews to be, for there to be interviews that exist that weren't recorded by you all. 
things happen sometimes, sure. but generally speaking, if it's a substantive interview, we will record it. Gotcha. Uh, were you all recording, you said that um, you made an attempt to speak with Mr. DeHart and um, in the uh, criminal investigations, uh, the sheriff's office interview rooms, um, they record those videos. Did you did you record as well? Yes. Okay. That, is that just a handheld, uh, your phone or a handheld device? Use a handheld device. Gotcha. Um, do you know if any evidence was recovered from the? I know you said you didn't process it. Do you know or you, have you been made aware that any evidence was recovered significant to the investigation from that silver Lexus? Yes, I've, I've discussed that earlier. Um, I have a, a list of some of the items, but not a complete list. Okay. What, and what, what, what did you include on your list that, that you of note that was recovered from that vehicle? Uh, six unfired forty caliber bullets, mm -hmm. a 9 millimeter mag, magazine, um, a fired projectile, Shotgun shells and a taser probe, uh, the probes and wires. Okay. Uh, the nine millimeter magazine was that loaded, unlo or did it have rounds in it, not have rounds in I it? I did not have that noted. Okay. Um, Do you have any idea how many search warrants have been issued in, in, in this investigation? I do not have that complete list. It's Multiple. Lengthy. Multiple. Yes. Okay. Uh, does it also include different vehicles? Houses, vehicles, cell phones. Sure. Um, what about social media? Do you know if you all have made any judicial uh, subpoenas or? Reservations have been made on those. Okay. He's, uh, Mr. DeHart's been charged with, um, with first-degree premeditated murder. Uh, you're the affiant on those, on those offenses, right? That's correct. Um, and I, I'm, I'm assuming that that's been done or you, you make that decision in conjunction with the, with the district attorney's office. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, in this case, I'll, I'll take it maybe step by step and talk about some trying to think about this a timeline. Um, at the point in time, we'll, we'll talk about from the initial stop, we'll talk about the first time Mr. DeHart stops on the Sevierville Road and the officer's first interaction with him to simply pull ahead, pull up. She does that twice. He, he finally pulls into the driveway. You've got so far so good where you're with me as far as where I'm at. At that point in time, were there, are there objective facts, facts that you can point to that we can tell the court about that leads you to believe that he'd formed the intent to kill either of these deputies at that point in time? Your Honor, I'm going to object. That calls for a legal conclusion. The facts are what they are. She's testified to the facts. The video is the facts. Any legal conclusions that might be drawn from the facts are argumentative, and we'll be making that argument here shortly, and I'm sure... Uh, the public defender's office will be happy to make a counter argument to whatever we make, but asking her to, to draw a legal conclusion um, based on facts is, is speculative. On, on Your Honor, I'm, I'm not asking her to draw a conclusion on whether the man's guilty, innocent, or any, any other type of legal conclusion other than to point the court to objective facts, so facts that the court can decide that this man's case should be bound over as charged with premeditated murder. I'm happy to read out, as, a, as an attorney in this court, I'm happy to read out the statute and what the elements and requirements are. The court has to take those into consideration. And facts that lead the court into knowing whether that is the case or not are pretty important. And it's not a legal argument. Your Honor, he is asking her to draw a legal conclusion because he's asking her which facts are relevant to the determination of this particular legal conclusion. She can testify to the facts. The facts are on the video. Her trying to conclude what the state's argument might be about which facts are evidence of premeditation is, again, asking her to speculate. I'm going to sustain the objection, Mr. Elrod. The court seems that the facts, and the court's familiar with the statute, and if the facts 
lead to the conclusion that the charges uh, should go forward? The court will not. Or if it doesn't, the court will do something else. I want to make sure I'm clear. The courts decided that that's the the, the courts ruled on it thus far, as far as the, with this case being bound over. I'm not understanding your question. Oh, well, you'll have to forgive me. I don't understand um, me asking about facts that lead this officer to conclude that charges be lodged against the defendant. That's 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 the simple question that I'm posing. I'm not posing a legal argument or the for this witness to put forward a legal argument, I'd like to hear from her as to what facts constitute this offense. He's asking her, Your Honor, specifically to say what the state's position is as it relates to the legal conclusion that the facts support the charge. That's what he's asking her to do. If he wants to ask her about any fact that she observed on that video, which we've all seen, by the way, he's asking her to testify to what we've all seen, um, that's asking her to speculate about what the state's argument is about the, the basis for the charge of first degree murder. We have arguments about that, and again, we'd be happy to point them. We can't argue about anything that's not been introduced into evidence. We can't suggest anything about what's been introduced into evidence. All that's relevant for determination about probable cause is what the court has heard and seen here today. She can only speculate about what that argument is going to be. And frankly, her opinion is irrelevant in terms of which of them we're going to think is conclusory or suggests that it is a first degree murder and an attempted first degree murder. I agree with the state, Mr. Elrod. I understand. In thinking back and watching that video, you've watched it multiple times, correct? I have. Okay. In watching that video, at what point in this timeline? Can you point out, before the shooting takes place, any aggressive behavior that Mr. DeHart exhibits? He refuses to comply. Okay. He's out of the vehicle after being asked several times. He tussles with the officer, as she had stated, uh, when she was trying to get his seat belt off. Okay. Um, does he curse her? I don't think he does. Does he hit her? Does he hit or curse Deputy McCowan? No. Okay. Um, does he relate to them by any means, orally, written, or any other type of communication, his intent to do them harm? He does not. He doesn't do that. He, no, at that point, he was just uh, resisting to step out of the vehicle. Sure. And at the point through which he the taser's deployed, uh, it's 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 doing what it's designed to do. It's shocking him. They're trying to incapacitate. They're trying to get him to comply with him. During that course, does he exhibit any of those behaviors that I just asked you about? That's when he tussles with the officer. As that's how she described it, I believe. Right, Res resists and just I think yes. if I'm accurate, she says that she keeps him from. Um, or he, excuse me, he keeps her from um, getting the seatbelt off, and she's not able to get the seatbelt off to roll him to get him out of there. Correct. It, it is hard to see in the video, mm -hmm. so that's why that's very important. And uh, Deputy Ayers was the one that right, right. Um, so he doesn't specifically tell him tell either of the two deputies that he's going to hurt or harm them, or he wishes to hurt or harm them. He does not say that. Okay. Um, when you interviewed him or attempted to interview him, and, and I know you said that he made some statements during that, that point in time um, about remorse for different things, um, did he state to you at any time then his intent to hurt, harm, or kill either two of these deputies? He did not. Okay. Are you aware of any other witnesses that have any information with, with regard to statements that he's made as to those those type of statements. There were multiple interviews made. Those reports are not complete, so I don't have the um, completed reports on Sure, but we, but so in other words, we don't we don't know quite yet whether he's made statements or anybody's come forward to other de to other agents with regard to statements he may or may not have made about this incident. I do not have those reports. Okay, that's fair. 
Um, And it's okay if you don't know the answer to some of these questions, just let me know if you don't. Um, obviously, uh, the uh, offense, alleged offense, occurred on um, the 8th of February. Mr. DeHart was not uh, taken into custody, I believe, until the 13th of February. Is that accurate? That is. So during that time, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll call it a search or call it a manhunt. I think we've, we've heard that referenced here today. Um, it was publicized quite a bit, correct? It was. Okay, and that's not only to, one, keep the public apprised of a relatively important thing in the community, correct? Yes. But secondly, they're actively trying to search for this man. That's correct. Do you have any idea how many times that, um, that law enforcement reached out to, to publicize and to get, the, to get that message out? Do you have any idea? I do not. Okay. And yeah, with that, I don't, I don't suppose you would know what agencies, what news organizations and agencies they were trying to seek out and get, get that message and get the word out. I do not know. Okay. In the, in the search for Mr. DeHart, did you have any, I know that you said there were dozens of agents involved in the scene processing, interviewing witnesses as well as searching for him. Is that accurate? That's correct. Um, were you involved in, in the search and trying to track him down as well? Very little. There, there's actually two cases that TBI has opened. Uh, we have the Talk 10 Fugitive case, which is handled by another agent, and then the Officer Ball shooting, which is handled by myself. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Uh, and, th and that's how you, be you became involved, because that firearms were employed not only against deputies, but by deputies. Correct. Okay. Uh, what the, I guess that you said you was the top 10 fugitive list. What, what deputies involved that? Is it Mr. Is it Agent Elkins? No. Who, who is the other? It's Special Agent Ed is really Gill. Okay. Uh, do you, where is he stationed or based out of? Is it Knoxville? He's out of Knoxville. Okay. All right. Um, what other do you, I know there were multiple, not only just local. What other law enforcement agencies were assisting in not only the, the manhunt, the search for Mr. DeHart, but also in processing and working the investigation. Well, I want, I'd like to ask it in two different ways. One, do you know all the agencies even involved with the search for Mr. DeHart? I do not know all of them. I do not have a process. Gotcha. Uh, what a, it fair to say that multiple state agencies and multiple federal agencies? Yes. Uh, would the same be true in, in the agencies that were assisting in the actual investigation, meaning processing, interviewing, you know, working and going through the case to make a prosecutable case? Is that same would be true? TBI uh, was responsible for the officer involved shooting, uh -huh. and we will be the ones that conduct that case. Uh, I'm sure that Blount County will have their own internal investigation that they will do for themselves. Uh, gotcha. Have you had an occasion to interview any of the, the co-defendants, I'll, I'll call them co-defendants, the folks that have been arrested subsequent to the to this shooting? Have you had your aunt yourself been able to interview those folks? I spoke with Carrie Matthews. Okay. You, you interviewed her? Yes. Um, how soon after the shooting was that? Did you remember how, when that took place? I believe it was, she's been uh, interviewed. Do, do you? Sure, that's okay. Uh, what pertinent information did you glean from from that interview with her? We were just trying to see if she had any information about where he would be. Gotcha. Did you any success with that? Not really. Okay. She she named several uh, friends and um, people that he hung, hung out with and family members. Um, but gotcha. Have you interviewed or had the occasion to interview any of Mr. DeHart's family or friends, some of the, that short list that she gave you? Have you had an occasion yourself to interview or talk to any of those folks? Other agents do that. Gotcha. 
That's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. the state's case for probable cause. Uh, Garner, any proof on behalf of the defense? No proof, Your Honor. We any argument, General? Very briefly, Your Honor. <coughs> Frankly, Your Honor, the state was going to let the video speak for itself, but since the question regarding facts that might constitute premeditation has been raised, the state has one theory it will proceed on, Your Honor. And what the state will lay out the video shows is after shooting Deputy McCowan and Deputy Eggers five times, as Deputy McCowan is lying prone, disabled on the ground, and Deputy Eggers is fleeing for safety, the defendant opens the door of his car sticks his gun at a helpless man on the ground and pulls the trigger. The state will rely on those facts for premeditation. And the state will say that based on that, probable cause has been made. I made a tally as I was watching this video, and I counted 37 times they either asked lawfully or told lawfully the defendant to exit the vehicle. But General Jenkins counted 45. It doesn't matter what the number is. If one of those requests is complied with, Your Honor, if just one of those times the defendant complies with the request or order to step out of that vehicle, we're not here on a first-degree murder. We're not here on attempted first-degree murder. We're here on felon possession of marijuana, or felon in possession of a firearm and maybe a marijuana charge. It was his decisions to refuse those requests 37, 45 times, whatever it is, that led to us being here today, Your Honor. And you do not point a gun at two individuals and pull the trigger six times unless you intend to kill them. You do not point a gun at a man lying helpless on the ground and pull the trigger unless you intend to kill him. So respectfully, based on the video and the facts before the court, the state would ask this case be bound over to the grand jury. If court please, I think state clearly made out cases in counts two and three and we have no objection to them being bound over. On count one, is, as Mr. Elrod has already had a colloquy with the court about, uh, we question the state's premeditation uh, theory. Uh, clearly, their second-degree murder. Clearly, it was killing. It was out of with any justification. There's no any doubt about that. The question is, did this man plan it ahead of time? We suggest, court seen the videos, they have the best evidence. Court seen the videos. We suggest that there is no premeditation. It happened at the spur of the moment. He did it. Uh, we suggest it should be a second degree murder case and ask it be bound over on that charge. General, nothing further, Your Honor. Based upon the proof before the court, the court finds that there's probable cause to believe that the offense of first degree murder, attempted first degree murder, and the felon in possession of a weapon was committed by the defendant. Kenneth Wayne Dehart, and it was committed here in Blount County. Accordingly, the charges will be found over the grand jury for its determination of probable cause. Go ahead and remove the defendant, please. General, I'm going to give you back the original exhibit, but you're going to make sure. I will make sure they get a process. copy right now, Your Honor. Right. You have a sheet. You should have a sheet in a moment and let them talk with him. That's fine. I'll take that sheet out of there. I mean, I got Thank you. All right, court's adjourned. And that concludes the preliminary hearing for Kenneth DeHart, the man accused of shooting and killing Blunt County Sheriff's Deputy Greg McCowan, shooting and injuring Shelby Eggers, who we actually saw for the first time since this incident during this court hearing. Shelby Eggers was the first witness called by the state. She spoke calmly and clearly about the incident on February 8th. She spoke about 
how she noticed the car swerving in and out of its lane and was worried for the safety of other vehicles on the road and believed she may have an impaired driver behind the wheel. She walked up, introduced herself, asked DeHart to move his car. He did so. He had to move his car once again into the original driveway that Deputy Eggers asked him to move into. He was erratic in his behavior speaking to her. She testified that he would not stop talking. He was nervous. He seemed upset. And she testified that she smelled marijuana. Now, when she looked him up in her deputy cruiser, she found no active warrants for him. That is when she called Deputy Greg McCowan to the scene. And they proceeded to move forward with wanting to search the vehicle. That's when DeHart is shown on the body camera footage refusing several times to get out of the car. This is when the situation begins to escalate. Now, during the showing of the body camera footage, to be transparent, we moved away from that. We muted some of the audio and we chose to show our edited body camera footage. If you want to go see the full body camera footage, it is available for you right now inside the WVLT News app. But due to the graphic nature of that video, we wanted to not repeatedly show it in court today. So Eggers testified that body camera footage seemed to corroborate her testimony. Up next, we had the TBI witness, Maria Cutshaw. She is the lead investigator on the case. She spoke several times about the evidence that they have recovered, the vehicle, his vehicle, DeHart's vehicle that they have recovered, what was inside of that, and all of the evidence that they currently have. The state also admitted several convictions, aggravated assault conviction in 2003 of DeHart, a 2006 reckless endangerment with a deadly weapon conviction, and a 2018 aggravated assault conviction into their evidence today. This court hearing all started with a motion to continue the case for DeHart to have more time to fire his own lawyer, right to counsel of his choice. Now the judge immediately dismissed that and the court hearing continued as planned. The court hearing ended with the court finding probable cause of first degree murder. The defense was arguing that there was no premeditation in this case, so this should be taken down to a second degree murder charge. The judge did not agree. The judge ruled in favor of the state and found probable cause of first degree murder and is now sending this case to the grand jury. Again, Kenneth Tahart faces first degree murder, attempted first degree murder, and charges of being a felon in possession of a weapon. Accused of killing Deputy McCowan and injuring Deputy Shelby Eggers, who we saw for the first time today since that sad February 8th incident. Now this case goes to a grand jury for them to find probable cause and we'll move forward from there. We'll keep you updated on air and inside your WVLT news app, of course, as this case continues to unfold in Blunt County. Now I misspoke at the top of this video. The funeral for Deputy Greg McCowan took place last Wednesday. He was honored with full police honors. So many community members wanted to show their support and their respect for the fallen deputy, our Sam Luther captured it all. Thank you for your service, 344. This is your final call. A final call in tribute to the life of Deputy Greg McCowan at the funeral, remembered by friends. Whenever I needed somebody the most, I could call on him. Described by those that worked alongside him at the Blount County Sheriff's Office. Nice, kind, solid, steady, respected. And a sheriff, Grateful McCowan, made a career change at 39, chasing his dream to be in law enforcement. He had a passion. He wanted to serve the community. He wanted to make a difference. And there's no doubt in my mind that he did. On the way to Grandview Cemetery, hundreds of people lined Alcoa Highway as the procession passed by, there to send a message. Just to show his family that, you know, his life meant something to everyone, not just the people that worked with him. And say one final thank you to a man who gave his life in an effort to protect and serve East Tennessee. He's one of ours, and uh, he's out there at nighttime so my wife and my girls and I can sleep. 
and we just appreciate everything that they do. From a distance, people looked on as he was buried as a helicopter flyover signifies that a hero was being laid to rest. Deputy McCallan, we have it from here. Gone, but never forgotten.